In this course section, we're going to cover some essential Unix for bioinformatics. Now, rather than just passively uh, watching these next couple of videos, I want you to actually try out some of the Unix commands and the tools that we're going to learn here as you watch, as you go through. So please, if you haven't already got one open, open your favorite terminal application. Now, if you don't have a favorite one yet, don't worry, you will have by the, by the end of the, the, the week's content. If you're on a Mac for now, you can open the inbuilt uh, terminal program that comes with every new Macintosh computer. You can find this most easily by holding down the command key and space to bring up the search and type the word terminal and it'll find it there. If you wanna navigate to it directly, it lives in the utilities subfolder of your main applications folder where most of the software on your system will live. You'll find terminal there. Now, you're off, if you're on the Windows side, excuse me, or on a PC and you followed our course setup guide, you'll have Git Bash installed. And you can find that by going to your little Windows menu, the search and typing Git Bash, and it should find it for you, or going to the My Programs location on your PC to find it. Now, if you can't find it, probably means you haven't installed it. So go back to our course website, see the computer setup instructions and follow those instructions for the git for windows or the git bash uh, command program that, that we instruct you to install because you need it for this section of the course so please go do that now and bring up this uh, terminal and follow along now before we go too far and i confuse with terminology there is an important distinction here that i, I want you to be aware of now when we talk about uh, the stuff that we're actually going to learn this week, we're actually learning the shell. This is the command line interface that allows you to you know, interact with these computers, both your own and remote servers and supercomputers that we'll log into a little bit later by typing commands. Okay, it lets you drive the computer by typing text. Now the terminal, strictly speaking, that's just that little window, the graphical user interface that has popped up on your computers right now, right? It's a program uh, that you get when you open the terminal or you open mobile X term or you open git bash or you open iterm or whatever your favorite terminal emulator is, okay? So when, when we say here this week that we're learning, you know, the, the Unix or we're using the terminal, what we really mean, of course, we're introducing Unix, but we're really learning the shell, the Unix shell, because the those terminal programs, they'll change depending if you're using Git Bash or you're using Terminal on a Mac or iTerm or somewhere, something else. The different settings will, will change, of course, but underneath the shell that we're actually using, those commands that we're typing, they're gonna remain largely the same, whether it's a lab server that we're using to automate our bioinformatics workflow, or here, if it's our laptops that we're just learning these things on for the first time. Okay, so let's, assume that you've got it open and enter in some Unix commands. So before you type anything, just a little side note here is, this is a comment line, you know, the pound symbol, we've seen this before, the hash mark here, this is going to be ignored by the shell. It's not gonna try and execute anything that's contained on this line. Now, this is our first Unix command that we're gonna type in. This stands for print working directory, but we just type pwd. This is a theme that you'll see again and again with these Unix commands or these programs that we're actually running when we type these things. That's just the starting letters of print working directories. And we make it super, super short because it's quicker and easier to type. Okay, it means it's also obscure for newcomers. That's a pain point for us currently. And we're gonna have to get into the nerd speak to remember some of these acronyms and some of these commands. So PWD, what it'll do is it'll print where you are currently in your file system, where you are on your computer. For me, this would type, for example, users Barry. I'm sitting in the home area where I would end up when I log in to my computer. And it should do the same for you on your computer with your specific login name listed there, for example. Now, be sure you don't type that first little more than symbol. This is the command prompt here on my terminal application. For you, it might look different. It might be a pound symbol or it might be a colon or something else or it might just be a flashing cursor. Don't type that more than symbol. What we mean here is just the PWD. That's the bit to type. That's the command. So once you've done that and it's worked and it's printed out something for you and not an error message, try this second command. That's the LS command, which stands for a list. 
what this will do is it'll list the contents of the directory or uh, uh, none uh, nerd speak that means just the folder right directory and folder I mean the same sort of thing here uh, the contents the files and the other directories that are living there where you're sitting right now on your computer and what I want you to do please is uh, open up your uh, file explorer if you're on a PC or your your finder window if you're on a Mac and check that it makes sense are the files and the things listed there in your terminal do they look similar to what you see in your finder window okay what about if you change somewhere else like if you cd into your desktop directory so cd means change directory again we're keeping things as short as possible for typing so cd change directory space and then we tell it where we want to go desktop and then ls can we list out the contents of that location does that look the same as your finder window or your file explorer output so make sure that your uh, model for how this thing works is correct by checking it on some system that you're familiar with like your finder window or your file explorer okay so we've used a couple of commands there pwd to print where we are a cd to change directory and ls to list the files and contents seems kind of old school right we're typing at a you know terminal and it spits back some text at us it's not the most exciting thing in the world it's not fancy graphics these commands go back to you know the late 1960s 1968 or and even earlier some of them people have been typing those exact same commands to navigate file systems on computers why are we still using them today why am i teaching you them today why is most bioinformatics happening on these types of computers or indeed why is nearly all scientific computing happening on these unix like environments well the reason is of course that they're immensely useful especially when we're going to go and automate our work or develop new approaches to do our work so you know some of the core reasons or the main reasons why unix is still the primary environment for doing this kind of scientific computing are listed here now the first one and the last one here this modularity and this unix philosophy they're a little bit more obscure than than the other points here so I'll, I'll deal with them in a second separately but these others like the programmability right unix undoubtedly it offers the best software development environment for doing scientific computing because you know for example all the main programming languages they're all ready available there on these computers configured and ready to go and sometimes that's a difficult setup process on other computers like windows um, uh, operating systems for example and that's because these programming languages were developed first on a unix like environment and they're there configured and ready to roll now that also relates to the infrastructure that's there you know the access to existing tools and cutting edge methods because these scientific methods uh, and research tools were developed primarily on unix for unix like systems they're going to work best on those types of computing systems and then there's also this penultimate point here of reliability you know there's a reason why the web and all those web servers they run on unix uh, computers or linux machines primarily or why all the major supercomputers around the world all those top 100 machines or those lab servers that you'll use for your work why they're all unix based it's because they're tremendously reliable like we have a an old server that we just use for web server now but it's been up for three years we'll have a restart and not a single problem and it supports many many users simultaneously it's just got unparalleled reliability and usability when it comes to uh, serving multiple users at a time and staying available right what we call the uptime for these computers now I want to spend a little moment to explain the first and the last point here in this list of motivations here because they're a little bit more obscure of course but it also helps explain I think how we approach using Unix productively for our work this modularity in particular so the Unix shell at its core it was designed really to allow users to allow us to easily build kind of complex workflows or analysis pipelines by interfacing smaller modular programs together so we might have something like this this uh, first example here where we run each one of these little blocks is an individual Unix command a program that we run like wget to go and download some 
uh, data from a web server somewhere or a database somewhere, then we're going to pass it through some other modules to do something, to do some analysis, for example, each in a module one after the other. Now, an alternative approach, which is you know totally valid, and we often uh, see adopted, particularly by newcomers to the to the field, is to write a kind of single complex program that you know takes data as input, and after some time, maybe hours, maybe even longer, uh, of data processing, it outputs some figures or some table of results or something you want to do something with, maybe even publication quality uh, figure at the end of this analysis that's been running for some time. Now, that kind of all-in-one approach, or what I'm calling a monster approach, it is kind of cool in some ways. It does have some advantages. You know, you get a kind of an impressive product at the end of it, this custom script that's tailored to the analysis you want to do right now, and you can show it off to your buddies and your co-workers there in the, in the lab and say, hey, look what I wrote, look how big it is and what it does and the cool output I get. But more often than not, that approach has big disadvantages that make it not the best way to approach these kind of tasks, right? It often results in pretty large and therefore fragile, difficult to modify code that's therefore just by its very nature kind of inflexible and untransferable to other tasks where you might have different input data or different parameters you want to use. And it's going to be more error prone, right, than taking a more modular approach. So with this kind of Unix approach, with this idea of using modules to build up your analysis uh, work line or workflow and pipeline, you can spot errors more easily because you can figure out where they are occurring by inspecting the intermediate results as you go through from one module to the next. It's more clear which one might have had problems and which ones you can fix. You can also more easily experiment with other approaches. So if you wanted to take uh, one of those blocks that maybe does a blast search or something like that and replace it with one that does a hammer search, for example, you could do it. You could just swap those modules out. Those are Unix programs too, right, that you can run here at the command line. And it allows you, therefore, to tackle novel problems by remixing kind of existing modular tools or going back to things that you've done in the past and adapting them and applying them to new tasks. And that makes it a really powerful environment for doing your research work on. And this kind of brings us to what's often called the kind of Unix philosophy. And it's uh, you know it's often quoted here, like this quote from Doug McElroy, which states, you know, write programs that do one thing and do it well and write programs that work well together because this encourages kind of open standards and reusability for the, the community. Now, the second part of the, the quote we'll get to in a little minute, but it really is like, you know, if you go to the hardware store, if you go to Ace Hardware or Home Depot or other hardware stores are available and you go to the plumbing section or even the, you know, the garden irrigation section, you see this bewildering away of little adapters and specific components that are used in plumbing, right? And they all do specific things, but they all work well together, right? You can all put them together to achieve some new kind of irrigation system or new plumbing, right? And it's the same idea with this modular approach of these individual Unix programs that, that, that you'll see, right? Now, the second part of this quote that we'll come back to in a, in a little bit is, uh, it will become more clear what we mean here when we start to deal with how we can pass our data a bit like actually like water flowing through these pipes, how we'll actually flow data through these programs and not have to write them out into individual files and have all that uh, writing and reading, the kind of I.O. bottleneck of putting all your water into a bucket, for example, when it comes out of one of these attachments and then you have to read all that water or get it back into the next tool and pass it on. We'll work with streams. We'll have our large data sets that are maybe you know, the bottleneck is reading and writing them to, to files, we'll stream it through these programs to achieve our kind of algorithm that we want to apply to the data. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, another important note here is when I talk about Unix or I talk about Linux or we're using Mac OS X or OS X, whatever, whatever you want to call it, these are all uh, referring to a family of operating systems that include, of course, Linux, that's the typical free one, it's the most prevalent Unix family member out there that you'll see, and Mac OS X typically not free, for example, uh, but many of you are using on your laptops. These are, of course, distinct operating systems, but they're all related parts of this Unix family tree that I'm showing here in this image from uh, 
from Wikipedia that's available at the, at the link down below. They can all trace their origins and a lot of these core tools right back to the late 60s and early 70s, when of course we didn't have fancy graphical user interfaces or click point and click kind of interfaces to drive computers. But all these things, they've evolved and they're still around now because they're amazingly successful at what they do of that uh, modular approach to solving uh, problems. And it means that we have this unparalleled kind of framework or set of tools to go out and do our scientific computing and use all this infrastructure for our ends. Okay, so, you know, I've been using Unix in one form or another for over 20 years, kind of on a daily basis for my for my work. And I still learn new uh, programs, new commands and tricks and command flags and combinations of flags that mean I can do stuff more efficiently pretty frequently, right? And I've never met any person who knows everything there is to know about Unix. So really, you know, we're never going to learn everything about Unix in a course like this. That's just not... Uh, not not possible really. So the approach that I've decided to do here is to focus in really on a handful of the most important key Unix commands that will make you useful for your research right now. So when I was preparing for this class, what I actually did is I kept a log of all the commands, all the programs I would use for a whole week before uh, class. And then I've taken them here and I've organized them into these categories, the columns of this table here. And now remember that this Unix uh, approach to this whole philosophy is that it's modular. Each one of these is modular. So it means, you know, if we take just five of these, for example, or some number of these, let's say five, and we learn them, it means we can do way, way more than just five things. We can do 20 30 more things, right, with these five commands. And that makes it really powerful. So what we're going to do here is we're going to focus in on in these commands in yellow here. This is the, the core 22 odd Unix commands that I think you'll use 95% of the time you're working with Unix. Now, there'll be other commands you'll have to look up from time to time or or go to on a, on a, on a kind of bespoke basis. But these are the commands I use most of the time. And they'll be the commands that you use most of the time too, I'm pretty confident. So our task for this section is to learn these 20 odd commands and how to combine them to do useful kind of workflows aimed at solving your research problems. So the three listed here, you'll note that are in, in green, they're more involved. They're just Unix programs and commands, R and Git and Python here. But we're going to deal with those separately. Of course, R we've been focusing a lot on. Python, you know, it's a different course that we, that we have to, to learn those. And Git, we have a whole section of the course to learn about version control. These are a little bit more um, in-depth uh, delving into these sorts of uh, commands. So please join me in the next video where we actually start to use and learn these 20 odd key Unix commands. And in the second video of our uh, Essential Unix for Bioinformatics section, we're really going to dig in to using those commands together. So join me then. Thanks.